How to start a hobby game project? I have no idea. I never worked in professional game studio. Surely there is some sort of design document, some plan of the whole thing. There is budgeting, timing, guidelines, requirements and all of that stuff. I don't have that. I'm on a journey of exploration and experimentation. It will be a longer one. In this video, we'll take a look on designing communication over network for our game Lizard. We will look at some code, but more importantly, we'll make some key design choices that will impact the architecture of the whole project. This series is meant as a high-level tutorial, but not as a step-by-step -step tutorial. So you can't simply copy and paste what I wrote. The idea is that this will be perhaps more interesting than watching me write everything for hours. Let me know what you think. If this is too much or not enough for you, leave a comment or use survey uh, over here. So let's start with this. I've been thinking how to design this project. Multiplayer game, as such, it needs a client that player will be using and some remote counterpart to coordinate things between players. Modern design trends suggest going with microservices for scalability and maintainability of the whole thing. That's a good idea, but I think it will kill me with setup overhead as I'm solo developer here. Maybe one day. Instead, I'm going to follow the KISS rule. Keep it simple, stupid. A single server that will be written in the same language as the client, c -sharp. I'm aiming at something that would be extremely easy to set up and extend. So let's discuss things that servers should do and how to achieve them. Store and retrieve game data, maps, mobs, events, information on players. Generate data that adds to the game, mazes, items, quests. Receive and handle requests from the client. And four, send the game data and updates to the client. Of course, these are only the main tasks of the server and there is plenty of small stuff that goes on top of that, like user authorization, in-game chat, cheating prevention, server administration system, and so on. Client, on the other side, is responsible for presenting the data that it gets from the server to the user and offering easy and convenient way of navigating the game user interface. Then it takes user input and sends it to the server. Again, no actual gameplay mechanics is to be controlled by the client. So let's look at the first thing that we can do to have whole system running on some minimal feature set. We need to handle sending and receiving of the game data between client and the server. And to do this, we need some connectivity services and the data that we'll send back and forth. Eventually, I want to authenticate the users in-game with a game account and keep that information tied to a connection. So I'm going to use a TCP rather than UDP, which would require additional workload to tie the concrete user to a packet. TCP uses a little bit more bandwidth, but unlike UDP, it guarantees that you will know if your packets reached the destination and that they reached it in the order they were sent. Only thing that you're not getting with TCP is information on how big your packets are. So there is no way to separate them purely on protocol level. You need to add that information in yourself. Okay, that's all good. Sending a simple hello message is easy. You can find it in almost every example of a simple server code. But sending the entire game, the world and every single event, TCP doesn't understand objects, only bytes. You can't just say, hey TCP, send this map over to my client. Or can you? The process of turning objects to something we can store or send is called serialization and deserialization for the opposite. It isn't necessarily connected to networking as it can be used to store things in files or sending objects over pipes or serial ports. It is a fairly common technique. I can translate my objects to some common format like JSON or XML, or I can do a binary form. So let's think about this for a sec. Using JSON or XML has an advantage of being easy to read, debug and navigate as a human, but requires more data than binary format. 
really good design would allow you to switch back and forth between these wherever you need, or even handle both of them at the same time for your convenience. I'm fairly comfortable going straight to binary, as I have some experience with handling data in that form. Smaller is good, and harder to read by wannabe hackers. This is what I want. Now, I could write those serializers myself, just create a method that takes the fields of the object and packs them into byte array, and perhaps a constructor accepting a stream for the opposite of this process. This isn't a very maintainable solution, since any change in the structure of the object would require rewriting my handlers. As software developers, we need to be smart and save ourselves unnecessary trouble, especially if one of our fellow coders did the same thing already and it's committed to maintaining the solution for foreseeable future. This is the case for serialization in c -sharp. We have built-in classes that will do this for us. To use them, all we have to do is add serializable attribute to objects going over the network. And then we can utilize serialization.formatters.binary. Check out the URL in descriptions for the details. Now, when you think about such critical element of your system that is a foundation of service, it is good to have some understanding how performant this would be. Sure, it would use less traffic with binary form, but how long would it actually take to pack all of this data in? People online are very helpful when it comes to performance. Maxim Novak did some testing and shares this graph. Again, URL in the description. My data would be mostly small, as the updates are usually incremental events on top of what is already sent initially. So 370 bytes that he uses to test seems about right. To my surprise, JSON is way more performant than built-in binary format. Interesting. Something you perhaps wouldn't guess judging by appearances. I think we should go even beyond that and use Message Pack or Google Protobuffer framework. Since I have some experience with the second one, let's go with that. <laughs> All right, so protobuf works like this. Both client and server need to know the structure of the object that is being sent. Unlike JSON or XML, which sends the structure or schema with the actual data. This saves time and space, but requires tight synchronization of the schema. So let's keep that in mind and take a look how we use protobuf. First of all, we need to create the proto file, which will store our schema. Protobuf has its own format for this file and its own compiler that will make a C-sharp class out of them. Of course, other languages are supported too. Underneath the hood of this class, we will have methods that will take the fields of the class and store them in byte array, exactly as I would if I were to write this by hand. That's pretty clever, huh? Okay, how are we going to share our schemas between client and server so we don't have to copy them over each time we change something? Simple, we create two new projects in our Unity solution. First will be a c -sharp console project containing our server code that we won't share with the players. And second will be the shared library that will contain objects used by both Unity client and c -sharp server. Since everything is written in the same language, all we have to do is just add the references and we're good. If we were to use the default library and proto files, Protobuf compiler is going to generate c -sharp classes. These are called contracts and Protobuf makes them sealed, so they cannot be inherited and extended. This limitation helps Protobuf to behave correctly as protobuffers don't support inheritance and steers us in the direction of anti-corruption layer pattern, where you separate business models of each service from models of other services. While this general approach is very useful, it means that if we want to add some custom information on server side, we would have to copy the data from network object to some other class and access it there or keep a reference to the protobuf class in some server class that we would create to encapsulate it. It is also impossible to add custom methods to protobuf classes, even if they could be useful on both ends of the service. It makes sense as protobuf is intended to be language agnostic, 
but it doesn't help us much in this case. Imagine that you have a class that stores position of a character. This position class has x, y and z coordinates and you want to send those over. But also it would be very useful to have a method on that class that calculates distance between the two positions. Well, in protobuf, you can't simply add this method to the position class because it's generated and you cannot inherit from it because it's sealed. You could perhaps create an extension method or a class that operates on those objects and gives you results, but that makes it harder to use in a situation where your class should implement an interface. For example, iComparable. Copying to the local class seems to work, but that's just more boilerplate and overhead, which will get messy. More classes, more files, more stuff to navigate and think about. Enter protobuf.net, library created by Nick Craver, one of the superstars at Stack Exchange. This thing allows you to specify a protobuf serialization attributes on the classes you already have and use them as they would be generated by protobuf compiler. All you have to do is put a protocontract attribute on the class and proto member with an ID on the field. And you're done. Now you can add methods and fields not shared over the network and so on. Okay, but are we breaking the anti-corruption layer pattern here? Well, yes, we do. And we go against what founding fathers of protobuf wanted, as protobufnet supports inheritance on top of that which is a no-no in the basic protobuf world. With the design, it's always like that, a trade-off after trade-off. We won't have to copy the data from network object to the business object, but we will have more fragile service. If we change the interface of the server, the client that isn't updated breaks. Now, is that a problem in this project? No, not really. I don't really want backwards compatibility in my game and I'll only allow one client on the server, the one that I wrote. So let's sum up. We have three projects, client, server and shared models. And they will use protobuf to communicate over TCP IP and send models from commonly shared codebase. Next step is to look at the actual communication process. Since we'll be doing our serialization in protobuf, natural step would be to go with gRPC or Google Remote Procedure Calls. Framework which is built on top of protobuf. It's well supported, documented and works on almost any platform including c -sharp. In one word, great. So why didn't I use it? Here is the thing. I believe that some tasks that game server needs to accomplish are simply not possible on gRPC due to its service oriented nature. A typical service is reached by a client to fulfill a single request. And in most cases, that's it. Hardly ever these services keep the connection open to talk back to the clients for hours at a time. Usually there is a request to fulfill and a unit of work to be completed. Well, not in our case. gRPC is great and it actually supports full duplex connections, which would allow such scenario where client starts a connection, authenticates and sends packets back and forth. But it seems that this isn't that much different over the regular TCP. If you don't use multiple procedures, but instead talk over one channel. Well, to utilize some of that gRPC, you could perhaps talk to a server to some defined endpoints, but receive updates on one endpoint. Still not good enough, as you would have to authenticate each call to the server, which will be a significant overhead for games. On top of that, libraries for c -sharp don't provide real good ways of accessing the underlying channel from server side. So you could talk over full duplex channel, but each message would have to contain authentication header if you want to know who's talking. Too much for my liking. I'll pass. So what do we end up with? For clients, we'll go with simple TCP client from c -sharp standard library, just to connect to the server and poll for updates by reading network stream in Unity. It will do for now. We can refine this solution later if need be. 
server side is a bit more complex as we need to handle multiple clients and also worry about fragmented messages coming in. When we receive updates from network, we will receive them in correct order. But we may receive multiple packets in one read event, an incomplete packet or both. On top of that, we would like to store the list of connected clients and maybe add some useful information to them, like authentication status, who they are and maybe some details on the in-game character. Let's look at the code. We have async server class, which has generic parameter accepting anything that derives from connection. This will allow us to extend the connection with some game-related fields. But at the same time, we can reuse the server class in other projects that aren't game-oriented, perhaps in the future. We have a start method that spins the few listeners to accept new connections, a simple wrapper begin accept and actual accept method that puts the sockets from callback into connection class and registers the new connection in our connection map. If all went well, we start receiving on that connection. In any case, we resume accepting on that thread again. When we receive, we pass along the receive context, a small nifty class that contains the information about the connection and pre-allocated buffer for data coming over the network. So, if all went well and we received the data, we'll pass it to the connection to append it to the internal memory stream. This handles the issue with incomplete packets. Just store everything in memory stream. Also, every time you write to the stream, check how much data was already read. And if some threshold is hit, discard the unused information. Now we raise the on data event and we allow the serializer to unpack the stream. Serializer is shared between client and server because the protobuf is the common element. Here we are just checking if we have enough data in the stream. And if that's the case, we unpack it by calling a method from protobuf library. Now we can handle the structure we received. How to do that will be covered in the next video. Now, I appreciate this was a bit much, even for some more advanced developers. Please let me know how do you like this type of video. Does it work? Your feedback is building block for this channel. And oh yeah, subscribe. I'm gonna see you in the next one. Cheers.